Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel for the first time. We are on Geography Now, South Sudan. This was the latest one that dropped. I know it's been uh, for a, a few days, but I'm just now getting to it. Uh, so, South Sudan. Uh, apparently, there's going to be like a lot of military probably talk in this, or you know, rebellion or whatnot. Because when I searched for like a photo to kind of put right, you know, right here, uh, it was a lot of military stuff. So. I guess, um, guess it was not probably the most peaceful uh, country. Well, we did, you know, was there like Northern Sudan, Sudan, you know, Sudan, but, uh, uh, and so that, that was kind of a giveaway, I guess, Dave, when you, uh, when I seen uh, that episode, but uh, anyways, we're going to jump into this and hoping for, you know, another cool country that's kind of like, you know, kind of like, you know, how to explain like, a, you know, Kind of a, you know, crazy history, but it's kind of trying to bring itself together to, and things are, you know, flourishing right now, you know, kind of hoping kind of that kind of thing. Uh, so anyways, but before you please hit that like and subscribe button below, I'd really appreciate it. And uh, I guess I'm going through this without a drink. Yeah, because I forgot one. So uh, here we go, guys. 30 minute video. Woohoo! All right. Full screen. All right, I'm just guessing these are his guests. And probably gonna have a commercial. I am on a mission, reading books that I'm- Well, this is Perfect. it. Now that the Sudan episode has been done, we reach our last and final twin country. Born in 2011, this is the newest country on earth. And it all begins with some very tall people in a very large- I make sure it's right. Okay, volume's up. So for some reason, it seems very low to me, I'm sorry. This is the newest country on earth, and it all begins with newest. very tall people in a very large swamp. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, get a Geography Now mug at geographynow.com. It's not selling out if it's your merch. Oh, and uh, speaking of which, these shirts are made from unityshirtshop.com. Thank you, Ruba, from the Sudan episode for making these. If you'd like one of these, support Ruba's business at unityshirtshop.com. Now, South Sudan is not your typical African country. Everything from the physical makeup of the land to the people are completely distinguishable. And speaking of people, as you know, one thing we love to do on this show is have people from the country in the country episodes. So say hi Woo! to Geography Peeps, Akan and Nyamal. Oh. How are you guys doing? Great. <laughs> what are some things you think absolutely everybody must know about South Sudan? Very quickly, what do you think? Well, South Sudan is home of the most melanated and lengthy people on the planet. The food, mm -hmm. great, natural, mm -hmm. huh, amazing. There's so much we got to cover in this episode, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh All right, well, let's do it. I do appreciate the uh, Everyone who does come on the show from their country, everyone's proud of their country, you know. So it's that, that I, I love, you know, you know, country pride, you know. That's that's awesome to see. So as the newest country on earth, obviously boundaries and borders had to be established. But even then, things still got a little tricky. Let's explain in the animation. First of all, okay. the country is landlocked within East Central Africa, surrounded by six other countries, and has three disputed areas and one condominium. The first dispute lies within the Kafia Kingi salient, which technically belongs to them on paper according to the comprehensive peace agreement that they signed with Sudan. Sudanese forces are still mostly in control as it acts as a biosphere reserve for the Radom National Park. Fun fact, Warlord okay. Joseph Kony is speculated to be hiding here. Moving on, the border with Uganda also has some border dilemmas, especially around the town of Moyo. Historically, the borders were never really properly demarcated, so they just kind of left it up to the peoples in the area to figure it out. Finally, they have the Alemi Triangle. Long story short, this area at the tri point of Ethiopia and Kenya is under de facto Kenyan control, but claimed by South Sudan, as it had to do with confusing borders that were drawn and redrawn during British imperial years. If South Sudan were to come into control of this area, it would give them the most narrowest passage only a few meters wide to Lake Turkana. So is that like a thing that's going to end up happening to the people who live there or maybe the people who live next to South Sudan, like Ethiopia? Do you think that will end up becoming a thing or like, no, it's probably just, that's probably never going to happen and they're never going to control it. Just kind of curious to people in the area what their thoughts on this area. But yeah. But alas, Kenya has de facto control. Otherwise, they share the Abia condominium with Sudan. Like even people from Kenya, yeah, they're in the air, right? So yeah, let me know. Do you guys think that you guys will continue control of that? Or do you think, you know, South Sudan will eventually kind of actually take control of that? But yeah. 
Kana, but alas, Kenya has de facto control. Otherwise, they share the Abye condominium with Sudan, which means both countries have joint control over it, as agreed upon after independence. Okay. Moving on, the country is divided into 10 states, two administrative areas, and of course, the special administrative area of Abye. Aw, this state is called Unity, and this one's called Lakes. The two administrative areas are Pibor and Ruwang, which act as zones that have a slightly different status due to various compromises made with inhabiting ethnic groups. In any case, the capital and largest city is Juba, located in the southern part of the country. Here you can also find the largest and busiest airport, Juba International, which serves as the main hub for any foreign visits to the country. From there, the second largest city would be Bor, located about 100 miles or 160 kilometers north of Juba in the Jongle state. However, the second busiest airport is actually located in the fifth largest city, Malakal, located in the north and eastern Nile state. With the exception of the inner city roads and one highway between Juba and Nimule on the border with Uganda, nearly all the rest of the roads of South Sudan are unpaved gravel roads. Finally, the country has only one railway that connects them to Sudan from the city of Wau in the northwest to the city of Bamnusa in Sudan. The line was heavily destroyed during the Civil War, but rehabilitated with UN funds and reopened in 2010. Keep in mind, good, the states good. are often bunched into three historical provinces that many people might refer to if you ask them. They are Barkazal, Equatoria, and Greater Upper Nile. Also, Juba isn't even that old. It actually... Yeah, what are the, I guess... Uh... I'm assuming like the people from, you know, Sudan, and South Sudan are you guys, you know, is there like a grudge against each other or, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the political thing, you know, it's just like, you know, the politicians kind of thing are the ones that maybe you guys dislike from each other's country, but the people are just fine and just like everyone's all cool with each other. I'm assuming. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. But yeah. We started as a trading post made by Greek settlers in the 1920s. Oh. And speaking of condominiums, South Sudan used to belong to the largest one ever made, the Anglo-Egyptian condominium. In fact, South Sudan was kind of triple colonized. It was like... Look, Egypt, technically run by an Albanian guy under the Ottoman Empire. You and I are both powerful people. Let's say we team up and we control pretty much the whole Nile. Okay, so we're not part of the British anymore, but I'm still in charge of you. Okay, I'm not part of Egypt anymore, but I'm still in charge of you. Okay, we had two civil wars after giving you autonomy. Clearly, we can't stick as one. Here's your independence. Yeah, okay, thanks. Oh, and also <laughs> you can't use our oil pipes. What? Yeah, that's an incredibly condensed version, but yeah, triple colonized. You get, you get the point. Now, the thing about South Sudan... Dang, so Sudan, man. Just, oh my god. I kind of feel bad. I feel like it, you know, the history guys kind of been like walked all over and kind of, it's kind of, I bet it's probably nice to kind of like have your independence and not, you know, kind of uh, have that outside influence kind of thing. So, well, let me know about that too in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry. That's an incredibly condensed version, but yeah, triple colonized. You get, you get the point. Now, the thing about South Sudan is that even though cities are growing, they still have one of the most world-dispersed populations on Earth. So obviously, due to this interesting layout, getting around in South Sudan is quite different from most places. For example, they have like an app that's kind of like Uber. It's called Shilu Ana. Um, what do you guys know about getting around in South Sudan? Huh. Like, I visited a couple years ago. There's no like direct way or direct direction of how to get around every man for themselves every man. Luck. oh also wow uh, Yamal, you wanted to mention a cool place uh what was it so basically you might like just hike everywhere or kind of like taxis or you know just kind of like hey kid i'll give you so and so money and can you take me to so and so place there's not really i guess a uh, reliable bus system or whatnot kind of thing. So I guess a new country is still kind of trying to grow and yes, they basically establish, I guess, everything, I'm assuming. Interesting. We can't forget Nasa. That is the city where my family is from, my parents. So shout out to Nasa. What ethnic group is from there? Nuer. Hmm, so if you want to learn about the new air people. Oh, and uh, Akan, you said something about hotels in South Sudan. What, what was it about? So when I went to South Sudan, I realized that a lot of people lived in um, hotels. And those are people that had the means, the money. Um, otherwise, people lived in like huts and places with no electricity. So it's kind of like, if you got the money, you go for a hotel. Exactly. So there's like... Wow, so there's no like condominiums? Like you think you had the money they had like I guess built some condominiums, but hotels? Wow, interesting. 
places with no electricity. So it's kind of like, if you got the money, you go for a hotel. Exactly. In addition, there's so many cool nature spots of South Sudan, and that just, uh, I guess that brings us on to the next segment. The... The... Now here's the thing, yes, South Sudan usually punctuates its reigns on the poorest countries by nominal GDP lists. And yes, statistically, the majority of the population, especially in rural areas, don't have regular access to certain utilities. But the funny thing is, by all means, it's a nation with lots of potential to flourish, but it's just you know, the political atmosphere always kind of gets in the way. The politicians, everything just... Uh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the good yeah. news is the dust is now just starting to settle. And there's a lot of promising recovery work happening. First, let's explain the physical layout. Now, from the globe, you can tell that South Sudan's domain lies just below the Sahara in the beginning of the lush green belt of Africa. This means the majority of the country is lush with tropical grasslands and savannas and forests. This is partially due to the Ironstone Plateau on the west side of the country, a slightly elevated region about 800 to 1,000 meters above sea level that gets copious amounts of rain that inevitably flush into the Barkazal region. The only places of noticeable arid landscape would be the far north upper Nile salient area on the border with Sudan and the far southeastern corner on the Alemi Triangle with Kenya and Ethiopia. All the lush greenery is fed by the longest and most important river of the nation, the White Nile. Nile. The thing is, the White Nile isn't even easily traceable due to the fact that it feeds through the largest freshwater wetland in the Nile Basin, the massive and famous Sud. At some point past the town of Malakal, the White Nile just kind of thins out and flattens into all the Ironstone Plateau runoff, creating an incredibly massive swamp with an impossibly wow. complicated maze of disjointed tributaries that sometimes dead end, dry up, or cut off into oxbow lakes. This is where it gets its name from, the Sud being Arabic for barrier or obstruction. In ancient times, the Egyptians couldn't get past this maze and neither could the Romans. Many sources... Do people live out there in, the, in like the swampy area? You know, they're curious. This will just claim that the Sud Swamp is considered the largest inland body of water in itself, since it's too difficult to measure the constantly fluctuating levels of water in dry and wet seasons. Oh, However, okay. I kind of wanted to be a little bit. Okay, so it could be kind of hard to kind of live out there, considering it fluctuates. You might get your place flooded. You know, I guess you can be more in the outskirts of it, but okay the constantly fluctuating levels of water in dry and wet seasons. However, I kind of wanted to be a little bit more thorough and see if there were any actual lakes of substantial volume, and I believe this one, near the 7 degree latitude, 30 degree longitude line, near the village of Genglil, is the largest of all okay. the river lakes. All these waters, though, eventually meet up in the south, where the highest elevations are in the Imatong Mountains, near Uganda. And it is also here where you can find the tallest peak of the nation, Mount Kinyeti, at about 3,200 meters high. Yeah, water is almost overly above abundant in South Sudan, and the people here are kind of flood experts. For example, in some places like Awil, the capital of Barkazal, the population fluctuates seasonally as people move back and forth between the plains during the dry season to tend to their crop fields, and then they move back to the city when the floods return. Now here's something wow. even more interesting. South Sudan is actually very rich in oil. See, South Sudan actually ranks third in oil reserves in Sub-Saharan Africa, most blocks located in the northern part of the country. Here, the potential to produce 3.5 billion barrels annually exists. However, only about 10% of it is tapped. Hey, you destroyed some of the oil fields in the Civil War like Block 5, and then you suspended us from using your oil pipes in 2012. Yeah, but then I reopened them because clearly you need my port for global trade and my refineries because you don't have any. Not for long, because I'm building two refineries. Then hopefully I can ditch you for the Lapset project. Wait. What? <laughs> oh, you <laughs> little <laughs> Yeah, as of 2021, the Ministry of Petroleum started their first rounds of investment bidding for oil licensing. And currently they are trying to invest in connecting a pipeline to Lamu port in Kenya. But it will take some time and it has to work out perfectly. Nonetheless, much of the economic progress was hindered in the decade following independence. Okay, so like the, the potential, like, you know, right now you have people living in huts and you maybe if you have some money, you live in hotels. But the potential in the future, like for the for you know South Sudan to flourish, is pretty up there. You know, they have only ten percent of that oil is tapped. Like they got a lot of money they can be making here uh, in the future. Who knows how how long that'll take though? But you know, things are definitely looking up down the line. 
it's for now Sasaran yeah. still currently has one of the most underdeveloped economies with the highest aid dependency on earth they even import much of their food from neighboring Uganda and Kenya which is weird because the World Food Program estimates that about 90% of their country is arable yet only about 5% is cultivated regardless Why? of the low GDP statistics they don't seem to have many problems with food insecurity due to the highly fertile lands most people have access to their own subsistence crops and they have one of the largest population of pastoralists in the world in fact 90 percent arable and plus you have that oil oh my god like you guys man sky's the limit it seems like for you you know if you live over there i mean just Woo. Props. And they have one of the largest population of pastoralists in the world. In fact, there are more cattle in the country than people. Wow. Speaking of cattle, let's move on to the wildlife section with Gary Harlow to explain. Woo. Hey everybody, so yeah, Caleb aka Gary Harlow was gonna film this, but his wife is incredibly pregnant. She could be giving birth like right now as we speak. So. I'm gonna fill in. Six national parks, 11 nature reserves, all taking up about 15% of their entire land mass. Thanks to the low density of human population, they have the second largest mammal migration on earth. About 900 species of birds can be found here, including the unique looking shoe bill bird, because its bill looks like a shoe. <laughs> Look at him. But if you're lucky, you can see the national animal, the African- You gotta be a lot of safaris there then, like a lot of people maybe like vacationing there just to like, yeah, you know, see the wildlife and stuff. Let me know if that's a thing, you know, over there in South Sudan. African fish eagle. South Sudan is a refuge for some incredibly rare species, such as Grevy's zebra, the largest of all the zebras, and the African wild dog. Of course, with lots Ooh. of rivers and water bodies, you can find lots of fish, such as the bichir fish. It's a lungfish. It can partially breathe on land and crawl up with its pectoral fins. What? In fact, it's often said that fish in South Sudan live long and die old because people don't eat fish that much in South Sudan. They're more focused on livestock. You could potentially catch a huge tilapia, perch, or catfish like this size of you in their rivers or waters so that's pretty much all i got here uh caleb man yeah so i guess people who love the fish who are not from south sudan man if you guys want to catch yourself a nice big fish and have a great photo of yourself like holding up one of those giant fish man go to south sudan man that's i mean i'm not a big fisher you know i don't like i'm not a big big at fishing but i, I love you know every once in a while i'd love to be able to get out there and fish and that'd be cool you know if I could kiss them that big out there, wow, that's cool. Can't wait Can't to wait see, see your kid. kid. Have a good one. Well, that's interesting to you learn. Don't, you don't fish a lot, though. We it's weird. Fish. If you we want. could. I wonder like, why. The that's really people interesting. People focus on that kind of aspect. You guys love your livestock, you, but you have so much fish. <laughs> Go more fishing. Go fishing more. <laughs> Can't swim. <laughs> Can't swim. <laughs> Take this away, Akon. 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 Well, regardless, Sassaran definitely has an amazing food scene that is very underrated. To explain more, here's Langfala. To be honest, we have a lot of cuisines, but let me just pick some of them. We have Asida, and we have a Kisra that was inherited from the north. We have Manyakelo, we have a Kop, we have Walwal. And the good thing of Walwal, you use it with Tung. Coming to uh, the Equatorial, so there is a Gwede Gwede, there is Somagarubutu, there is Ochola Mero, Dodo, Janga Janga, and also breweries is part of our life. We do have a Kwete, we have Kenyimuru, we have Guntok. We uh. love food. We offer food to you when you come to us. We eat when we are at the funeral. We eat when we are. If you, if you have an event without food, nobody's going to like speak good about it. Thank you, Langfala. Fun fact: if you order a combo with a drink and fries, you'll get a combo combo. <laughs> oh no, you have to like, literally. Slap Actually, slap him. Yes, yes. Yeah, slap him. Oh. Your mom's <laughs> best dish that she can make. Go. Club. Ooh, easily. Club. Go. It's, um, the best that I would choose this Mula Kudra and people come together like, and you all share. Everything's kind of communal when you eat, right? Right. It's weird to eat alone. Like. Yes. <laughs> if you're cooking, you have to cook for everybody in the house. Yes. In any case, like the food, the people of South Sudan come in so many different groups and styles. Let's talk about that now in... No medical exam. So basically, all that. On policies under one million. A friend recommended Sorry, getting life guys. insurance through... But basically, it's like, you know, you guys have like your own like a buffet at the table kind of thing, right? It's almost like, you know, like it's like kind of like having a big feast or Thanksgiving, everything's kind of like set on the table. Can you just kind of grab what you want, you kind of thing? It's, I guess, you know, 
kind of the same thing there. You don't have like your individual plates. You kind of just eats out of the same, same food, right? Right? Okay. I don't know if that made sense. All right. So Yamal Akan, what do you think it means to be South Sudanese? What is a South Sudanese person? Knowing a lot about yourself and naturally we're very spiritual people. So we believe in the power of your words. We believe in community. We believe in family. And adding on to what Nimal said, uh, being South Sudanese means that you have like an ambition mm -hmm. to be something greater than the place that you come from. Uh, cheers for South Sudanese people. All right. Awesome. <laughs> well, okay. So within South Sudan, there are tons of tribes and clans and ethnic groups. The vast majority though, belong to one of the most distinct people groups on the planet, the Nilotes. We'll talk about them in a bit, but first, the graph. First of all, the country has a population of about 11 million people with over 60 tribes or ethnic groups and about half of the population is 18 or under. Within these various groups, the vast majority at over 90%, some say up to 95%, are of the Nilotic branch, whereas the remaining population is mostly Niger-Congo groups, sometimes falling under the alternate Bantu title. Within these groups, a few stick out as the larger, more predominant communities. The Dinka are the largest at somewhere around 35% of the population, next being the Nuer at about about 16%. And from there, it's kind of debatable on which one comes in third, as statistical data is usually difficult to get exact estimates. But each of the three tribes, the Shiluk, Bari, and the Niger Congo Bantu group, the Azande, all have very similar populations and take up about 5% each. From there, the rest of the population is made up of the remaining 55 or so tribal and ethnic groups, usually ranging anywhere between a couple thousand to less than a hundred thousand each in population. Okay. We use the South Sudanese pound as our currency, and we use the Type C and D outlet. We also drive on the right side of the road. The official language of the country is English. However, of course, most people use the mother tongue of their tribe or ethnic group first. Keep in mind though, due to the influence of Sudan when they were under Sudan, some people, mostly in Juba, still speak a dialect of Arabic called Juba Arabic, which is kind of like a mix between Arabic, English, Turkish, and native words from various tribes. There is no single type of South Sudanese person. However, as as we explained, the vast majority are Nilotic peoples. We've talked about these people before yeah. in previous episodes, but recap. Nilotic peoples or Nilots in short are some of the most distinguishable individuals, not just in Africa, but the whole world. For one, due to our genetics, many have very commonly noticeable features, such as long, slender, ethnomorphic physiques, long limbs, some uh. of the darkest pigments of the skin <laughs> and height in the world. Okay, I'm standing right next to you guys. That's that. This yeah. is literally, this is the height range. So clearly Nimal is the tallest. The model. Period. Period. <laughs> That's right. After Dutch males, Nilotic men are considered the tallest people on earth and specifically the Dinka and Shiluk peoples averaging at about 181 to 182 centimeters respectively. Your men's wow. are the tallest. Our men. <laughs> the way you said that. Anywho, <laughs> faith-wise, almost two-thirds of the country are Christian, with about 30% adhering to traditional African beliefs like animism, and the remaining population is mostly Muslim. Now, considering how the majority of the country is Nilotic and non-Muslim, you might kind of pick up on the hints that played into the civil war when they were under Sud Sudan's rule in the north. Let's have geography Akech explain. So basically what happened was that, you know, Sudan and South Sudan, they're really two different lands. They're different every single way in terms of land, in terms of religion, in terms of culture, in terms of the people in general. As you know, in Sudan, people are a mix of Africans and Arabs, and in South Sudan, people are mostly just Africans. And then when Egypt colonized us, and then when Great Britain colonized us, it seems like they forced two different lands together. And then not only that is when they left, they also put most of the control of Sudan uh, to people from the north who in turn discriminated against people from the south. That is when they started rising up in the first war and there was about half a million deaths as a result of the war. But the war that most people know about between the north and the south was the second Sudanese civil war. That war cost approximately three million lives and that war has been led mostly by John Garang. He's a famous figure throughout all of Sudan. During that war, atrocities were committed by both sides on a massive scale. And not only that, it wasn't only just the South fighting the North, but it was tribes within the South fighting each other at that time while we were also fighting against Sudan. And I guess that's what also led to the bitterness between North and South Sudan. That's what also led to the bitterness between all the tribes in South Sudan. I'd say one thing that every single family in South Sudan has in common is that they all have lost somebody in that war against the North. It's a lot of people lost their lives at that war. Thank you, Akech. Then in 2013, there was... Okay, so there probably is like a you know, very intention between the two, you know, because 
you know, everyone lost family to to that war. So I'm sure that it's not, I'm sure that it's a recent war basically. So I'm sure that, you know, it's still around, you know, so, wow. It's the North. It's a lot of people lost their lives at that war. Thank you, I catch. Then in 2013, there was an internal war. In a nutshell, it went like, Oh, you are totally gonna coup d'etat me. Well, yes, I usually wear a cowboy hat in public. George W. Bush got me into this trend. Oh, that's crazy. I was totally not gonna coup d'etat you. Oh, oh, oh. oh, this is kind of stupid. I'm so tired. 400,000 people killed and a third of my country displaced. We're better than this. We need to stop. Peace deal? Yeah. yeah okay, peace Let's deal. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. margaritas. <laughs> And from there, a national unity government was established, giving representation to all political factions. In any case, like many of our previous episodes, South Sudan is a country with extreme tribal and ethnic group diversity. Even within the Dinka group, there are like 25 sub-clans. And you probably know more about that because you're part Dinka. Yep. What type of Dinka are you? So I'm Dinka and I'm from the Ngok Lol Yak. And you're also part Shiluk. Part Shiluk. So yeah. you're Nuer, but... What part of Nuer are you? Well, I'm Nuer, but I failed to mention that my dad's mom is Dinka. Ooh. And she's Dinka Bur. So I'm Gajok, so I'm Nuer, and I'm from the Gajok tribe within the Nuer. What is it like when you meet other Nuer people or you meet other Dinka or Shiluk people? I mean, it's like we connect in ways that are, you know, beyond such like a tight-knit community. Um, for me, like, I think it's awesome when I run across a person that speaks the same language as I speak so that I keep that language, you know, I remember yeah. that language always. Yeah. yeah, especially like also me identifying as Noor, but yeah. also having Dinka. I'm Dinka and I'm mixed with Shilug. I think that's a blessing though. You got two different worlds in you. I'm half Korean, half European. And we're all American. So, yeah. <laughs> so obviously we don't have time to discuss all the groups and their traditions that would take way too long. But to summarize in the broadest terms, most South Sudanese people can be culturally divided into the three regions that we discussed earlier. Barakazal come from Arabic meaning the Sea of Gazelle. Home of the largest group, the Dinka, as well as other Nilotic groups. This area is predominantly made of shrubland, which makes it perfect for cattle, which plays a huge part in the people's culture here. Then you have the Greater Upper Nile. This is the largest wetland area, seasonally flooded with marshes and river tributaries. This is home to most of the Nor people, as well as some of the Dinka and other tribes like the Shiluk and Nyuak and Birta. Okay. The Shiluk and Nyuak are actually famous for having kingdoms that formed centuries Ago. Finally, you have the Equatoria, the southern part of the country. This is the agriculture zone where most of the produce comes from. It's also home to the most ethnically diverse region wow. in the country. You get a lot yeah. of tribes here. Here you find dozens of tribes and clans like the Bari, Mandari, Toposa, Puku, and the largest non-Nilotic tribe, the Azande. All right, so what are some things about the South Sudanese culture and things that you've taken notes of from your understanding? How would you go about it? What would you say? This marriage is such a beautiful thing. It's huge in our culture. But another thing that I do want to talk about it is our ghost marriages, I guess. When a girl or a boy pass away young, a family member can have can get married and have children on behalf of the deceased. And this happens common what? throughout many different tribes, right? Different right. tribes. It's Nuer Dinka, I believe the Shuluk tribe also, but uh, there are different types of scarring that are done by needle. Mm -hmm. And in Nuer, um, the forehead scars that go over the forehead that are, are like lines, it's called God. And there are dots, and that's Bir. You know, it's completely normal and it's respected in the culture. And the cuts is for to distinguish like what tribe you're from. Everybody has a story in South Sudan. Right. Two cool wow. huts. They're very popular. They're made of mud and they last about 20 years. Man, that looks really cool though. But man, that's gotta hurt, man. That's gotta hurt to be able to make it form like that. Ouch. Wow, interesting stuff. And like the ghost marriages is, I'm sorry, it just, it just seemed very, very different. Uh, I never, never knew anything like that uh, before. So, wow, that's definitely, definitely interesting right there. Story in South Sudan. Right. Two cool huts. They're very popular. They're made of mud and they last about 20 years. You'll find them very often in South Sudan. Apparently, a lot of girls play Boru Boru. It's uh, basically a dodgeball game where there's like four girls on every side of one girl in the middle and they just whip a ball at her and she has to dodge them. And speaking of sports, let's go to art <laughs> with the sports part. 
Hey guys, I'm on daddy duty. This is awkward, but let's do it. Athletics in South Sudan, all right. One of the favorite pastimes at the tribe. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> He's distracting me. Just play over here. One of the most favorite pastimes people have in South Sudan is wrestling. It's mostly practiced though by the Dinka, Mundari, and Lakuta peoples. And often events are held every month. The objective is pretty simple. You just slam your opponent on the ground. Otherwise, South Sudan is known for a lot of other athletic accolades. In the 2016 Olympics, there were five South Sudanese athletes actually. They competed for the first time under the refugee Olympic team. Otherwise, it's well known that many of the South Sudanese diaspora in Australia have been drafted in the AFL making a name for themselves. But if there's one sport that's really put South Sudan on the map, it would probably be basketball. If there's one player that everybody knows from South Sudan in the NBA, it would probably be Manute Bol, tied for the tallest player ever in the NBA. Manu also had the longest arm span in NBA history. These advantages made him I mean, okay, well, as soon as they start saying like like the, t like the tallest like men in the world, I'm like, man, a lot of them got to be in the NBA, right? I mean, you know, I'm surprised that you know, you know, scouts from the NBA don't go to you know South Sudan and it's just basically try and find like some of the, you know, the tallest men and then you know try and uh, bring them back to America and uh, you know basically let them practice and learn you know the you know how to play basketball. Is basketball a thing there, like a, like a big sport there in South Sudan, or it's not really? Him one of the most imposing defensive players in the NBA. He set many block shot records, and the only player in the NBA to have more block shots than points scored. Later on, one of his many sons, Bulbo, actually followed in his footsteps and got recruited to the Miami Heat and then later to the Denver Nuggets. Wow. Mikhail, are you gonna carry on my legacy? Not Savania! Thank you, Art. So I would say like 10% of South Sudanese cultures on paper, 90% is really taught through spoken language and storytelling. Um, we want to unite everybody from South Sudan together and make it even stronger. That's the only way. Hey man, you got to move forward together. Exactly. Well, there's so much to talk about the culture. So you know what? Let's just give Hannah a little bit of a rundown on the general culture of South Sudan. Hannah, take it away. All right. <laughs> So there are a ton of groups of people in South Sudan, so there's not really one cultural experience. But there are some universal principles that everyone seems to adhere to. For one, similar to many nations in the area, age is very important. It's a really big no-no to insult an elder, and if you do it, it's kind of like a curse. Often cattle are considered a bigger form of wealth than actual money or other commodities. Someone give me a cow. In fact, it's actually kind of rare that the South Sudanese would eat cattle. The meat is usually reserved for a big occasion or for somebody really important who's visiting. Like in the Rwanda episode, so so yeah, you know, they might not have everyone live in huts and stuff, but like no one's going hungry and stuff. And there's like so much fish or so much cattle. I mean, everyone's everyone's being fed. It's not like you know, I mean, people are starving there. They're just kind of you know, it seemed like you know, like was laid probably was laid back people just enjoying life and don't probably just don't need all these extras, you know, that maybe other countries, you know, have you know, kind of thing. So uh, it, it seems like, you know, pretty, uh, pretty, you said, I said, relaxed country with a bunch of food to eat. And yes, yeah, it seems like everyone's kind of content with how they're living. But obviously, they said in the beginning, everyone has their dreams and everything like that. And he wants to improve. And obviously, so Sudan is just now getting that uh, their uh, kind of like feet wet. They're just now kind of trying to like do that. So yeah. Awesome stuff to come from South Sudan. South Sudanese will actually trade cattle during a marriage. It's like a cattle dowry tradition. And this is why bartering culture is really important and not just for marriage dowries. You can do it for pretty much anything. You can trade things for crops, labor, clothing, whatever. This is because most of the country operates under customary law. This is why social structures like marriages are addressed in the home, community, and tribal councils. Everywhere on the streets and walls, especially in Juba, you will see acrylic murals with the overall 
overarching theme of peace. Awesome. Many are done by the Visual Art Association group Anataban. You'll see hashtag Anataban awesome. on many of these murals. And speaking of art, there is an amazing story about South Sudan's film industry, starting with the Woyi Film and TV Industry, a group that was created out of a refugee camp, and now they make movies in South Sudan. So if you want to learn more about that, follow me on Filmography Now. It's my new YouTube channel. Hannah has a spin-off. She Hannah talks has a about film. Which brings us to Keith, who is actually back back from Florida, moving to Los <laughs> Angeles. Are we happy about it? Are we sad? Comment below. Let us know. Wow. Keith. Hola! Yeah, he's the new tenant. Just so y'all know, uh, this is uh, a band from Sri Lanka. They're called Shihara, uh, the singer of the band. She loves geography now, so she sent this shirt in. Woo! Drink root beer. It really is root beer, not real beer. Yes, root beer. And I'm back in LA. All right, South Sudan. Today, music is actually seeing a huge revival. During the years when they were under Sudan, especially in the 90s, much of the music tracks in the recordings were actually destroyed because Sudan actually wanted to promote their propaganda. During that time though, there was an underground movement that sidestepped the government restrictions. South Sudanese artists would intentionally mix different languages and music styles to be able to covertly hide their meanings of their songs. And in 2005, these artists collaborated. This moment sparked a cultural milestone. From then, many notable artists have come out like these people. Even this one's known about making a song about big butts. I got one of those. I look forward to seeing many great artists in the future. If you know any more, write in the comments below. Oh, before I go, if you guys remember the South Africa episode, I talked about a song called Doof Doof by an artist named Synth Peter. He's got nominated to win essentially what is a Grammy Award for South Africa. Cheers to you guys. I'm Keith, the real Florida man. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. All right, and with that, it's time to move on to our last segment, The Friends of South Sudan. Let's go. So South Sudan might be a new nation, but some of our diplomatic relationships go back thousands of years. So with South Sudan, upon their independence, many countries immediately decided to recognize them, including all members of the United Security Council, followed by admittance into many IGOs, such as the African Union, the East African Community, and weirdly enough, even the Arab League. However, there is currently a strong opposition to membership, since there is only a small Arab-speaking community, and also it kind of reminds them of their past, so... Yeah. The first country to recognize them, obviously, was their former ruler, Sudan. Today, relations with Sudan is kind of, uh, interesting. Obviously, the war still has lasting ramifications on the way that they perceive Sudan today, and usually it's not the most favorable view, but more like a, uh, let's just not talk about it and move on. But hey, good luck, which is where the new stuff comes in. As mentioned, the US and UK are the largest donors of aid to South Sudan, and also hold the largest communities of South Sudanese people in diaspora outside of Africa, followed by Canada and Australia, most of whom Yay. as refugees during war times. In addition, South Sudan also applied to become a member of the Commonwealth of Nations. Speaking of which, India and Bangladesh have been key figures in their internal development affairs. In fact, the first ever state visit from a president happened in 2015 as Salva Kiir met up with Narendra Modi during the India-Africa Forum Summit. Bangladesh also had a hand as the Bangladesh Army Engineering Contingent was deployed to help construct and repair roadways post-war. Today, high-level delegates have also been sent to explore future investment opportunities, mostly in the agricultural field. When it comes to their closest friends, however, most South Sudanese people I have talked to will either say one of three East African nations, Ethiopia, Kenya, or Uganda. In addition to sharing some of the tribal overlap over the borders, all three of these nations took in the most refugees during war times, and many of the diaspora spent their whole lives generationally within them. Ethiopia played a huge role in helping with negotiations during the South Sudan Civil War in 2013, and peace agreements were signed here as well. In addition, Ethiopia always has their eye on South Sudan, as they are Nile River nations that have a huge impact on anything that eventually flows back up to Egypt. Kenya was one of the strongest supporters of their independence. Like Ethiopia, they acted as a mediator during conflict with Sudan, as the Machikos Protocol was signed here in 2002, creating a ceasefire. However, after that, they were always leaning with South Sudan all the way up to their independence in 2011. In addition, Kenya provides much of the financial services and commercial banks to South Sudan, and imports much of their wood, and as mentioned before, is currently working on constructing pipelines to assist their oil industry, giving them access to the Indian Ocean. Uganda also helped much during conflict years, 
years and since then has become their largest import partner. South Sudan prefers to buy Ugandan produce more than any other nation, and a railway is currently underway to assist furthering trade. In addition, they have a very strong educational exchange as many students study abroad in Uganda and complete their undergraduate or graduate studies here or in Kenya. Also, Uganda and Kenya send the most teachers over to South Sudan to assist their shortage in the profession. Overall, together, these three countries are usually the go-to people for South Sudan that they can depend on and probably will That's for the awesome. foreseeable future. So in conclusion, I'm going to give it to you. We come from such a beautiful country with a beautiful culture, with so much diversity within just one country. I'd also like to add on that in South Sudan, we need people that are interested or that want to make change. The only way to build the future is from the youth. My favorite thing about South Sudan is everyone is so united. It's like when you walk outside, everyone is your family. It just, everyone feels like home. It all feels like home. Thank you too. It's been awesome having you in the episode. Thank you so much for just sharing what you wanted to share about South Sudan. And with that, the next episode is going to be Suriname. Stay tuned. Well, there you have it guys, South Sudan. Uh Wow, it's, uh, it's very cool there that the friend zone thing where basically all South Sudan neighbors was, were like pulling for them. And then, uh, you know, when they got their independence, they're all basically helping South Sudan kind of build up, you know, with any kind of aid, you know, like I said, lumber, you know, food or whatnot. And so that's got to be feel pretty good for if you're living in South Sudan that, you know, you have other countries, your neighbors on your side, hoping that you can flourish. And there's a lot of... Uh, programs it looks like that's in place to, you know to where yeah you the I, I can't see why social media can't flourish and become you know this an even better country so uh you know shout out to south sudan yeah it seems like you're a lot of very welcoming people a lot of giant family i guess you know when you when you have war everyone kind of has to come together as family and you know you kind of have that uh uh you know have that in common and kind of thing so uh there's definitely that. So, but anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe button. I hope you guys like this video. And I hope you guys stick around for other future Geography Now or other kind of series I do videos. But anyways, guys, peace. Catch you guys in future videos. I am out of here. Woo!